Okay, so um, it's 3.10 and I've been told by Paul Henning that if I run over time, he's going to throw things at me. So I'm going to attempt not to run over time. And I'm also going to attempt to start close to on time. Uh, my name is George Neville Neal. I work on the FreeBSD project as well as several other things. Um, in particular, my area of interest is networking. And uh, this talk is called Network Protocol Testing in FreeBSD and in general. So I'm going to talk about a few things today. I will talk about how one does network testing, what I mean when I say network testing, and what kind of things I've been doing with FreeBSD. And hopefully this will be interesting <laughs> and useful. So what is network protocol testing? Why would we want to do it? Um, it turns out that writing network protocols is difficult. Uh, for those of you who've ever worked on them, you probably know this. Uh, this is actually why I like working on them. I, I once worked in user interfaces, which are also difficult, but in networking there are no product managers telling you the packet should be green. <laughs> so instead I went to work on network protocols that are deeply technical and very fun. Um, so they're hard to write. People make mistakes. I've made mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, so how do we find mistakes in complex systems? Well, we design various tests and carry them out over time. Hopefully when we find new problems, we put them into a regression test suite so when we release the next version of a piece of software, we don't have the same problem again. So why is this hard? Well, one of the things that makes networking fun is that network systems are non-deterministic which means you may get the message or you may not, um, and things don't generally move forward nicely and synchronously, uh, and you have a lot of problems. You're subject to message loss, there are time synchronization problems. Uh, also, protocol testing can often require lots of machines, or now that we have virtual machines, and I do a lot of testing this way, instances of virtual machines. Um, but you need a lot of boxes. And there are these nasty, what we call knock-on effects. So when everything works, it works perfectly. Um, but when something doesn't work, nothing works. And all of the machines begin to stop doing things. Um, it turns out, and I've, I, this, is, this is one of these uh, old people's comments. Now that I'm 40, I can say I'm old. Um, people seem to find systems thinking hard. And networking requires the ability, ability to do what I call systems thinking. Right? So there are people who, can very, who are very adept at making a single, line, a single stream of code work very well or very compactly. But there are very few people I've met in the world who can look at an entire large system like you know, a transaction processing system or the internet or some subsec subsection of the internet or a set of machines that are interacting and make any sense of what's going on. They might be able to understand one part, but they can't understand all of them. So in order to help us, you know, this is what makes network testing hard because Network testing is all about this kind of stuff. It's also what makes multi-threaded programming hard, but that is not the subject of this talk. So what are some measurements that matter if we're going to do network testing? Um, these are the three, correctness, latency, and bandwidth. Uh, these are performance tests. This is correctness. Most people do these tests first. I don't know why. Um, they don't test for correctness. They test for speed. Because, well, you know, if the thing runs really fast, that's good. Of course, if the thing runs really fast and drops all the packets, that's bad. But, you know, marketing people tend to want latency and bandwidth. So what are some, some types of protocol testing we could do? Um, there's specification inspection, and people actually do this. I was just involved in, in dealing with some of this stuff around IPv6. Um, you read what the designers said the protocol is going to do and you think about how it should work in the abstract and then you say, well, you know, if you do this and this and this and I do this, I can break your protocol. Um, your most powerful, it's actually one of the most powerful ways of doing testing because you get stuff beforehand and because it's broad based. If I find an, a broken problem in an implementation, that's bad for the implementation. If I find a broken thing in the protocol, I break all users, of, all users who have implemented that protocol to the specification. Um, but we're not going to look at specifications today because it's after lunch and there was only so much coffee. Right? So. <laughs> um, you can do code inspection. You can read code, which is always fairly important. Um, but I'm going to talk about these next two here. So protocol conformance testing, which uses real packets to ensure the implementation conforms to the spec. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about fuzzing tools. So um, fuzzing is not a new idea. 
um, if you read Slashdot, they think it's a new idea. But it turns out that there was, a, I forget his name, there was a professor in the States in the late 70s or early 80s who decided that he would test the um, uh, abilities of Unix commands, command line commands, not networking stuff, by feeding them garbage from dev random. And some large number of them seg faulted because no one had ever tested them with random garbage. So now this has suddenly again become a very popular thing to do with network protocols. Instead of doing something like saying, well I know that you know, once I've received uh, the syn ack from the other side, I should send it the ack and then we can open the connection. Instead I go, well the packet looks like this and I'm gonna send random garbage in this byte until the other side collapses and see if I can do that. So that's protocol fuzzing. We'll talk a little bit about that. Mostly I'm gonna talk about this. Um, so, what are some typical network protocol tests? This is my least favorite, um, but it seems to be the most common, which is, it works! Great, that's, that's very helpful. Um, you know, just because you've been able to download, you know, www.freebsd, netbsd, openbsd, dragonflybsd, or pick your BSD so I don't insult anyone, .org, does not mean your protocol stack is conformant, and does not mean that if I put it into a production network full of thousands of machines, it won't collapse, explode, cause a major outage, or any of these other things. All it means is, well, yes, it's not so broken that it doesn't transmit data. But that doesn't tell you much. Um, so other protocol testing systems that exist, there's Anvil and NetBits. Um, these are really expensive. I actually once worked with Anvil for an embedded systems company. And it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's a bad product, but I don't have $100,000 to test FreeBSD. And if anyone does, please see me after the talk. Um, <laughs> I, and I'll, I'll share a cut with Paul Henning, because, um, you know, for the conference. And NetBits is a hardware device to do this. Next down is a system that the WIDE project, who I spelled wrong, um, called Tahi, that they built, used for IPv6 and IPsec testing. It has its own issues, uh, part of which is, uh, I'm going to insult a large group of people now, it's written in Perl. <clears throat> Enough said. And uh, so... <laughs> Um, then there's NetPerf and NetPipe, and this is the thing that people do where they, you know, they just pump data through the socket interface and they hope that it all works. So what is, I don't know what was just said, but it's very funny. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what, how do we do this kind of stuff? What, what kind of system do you usually see? Well, the simplest test rig is one that looks a lot like this, and you'll notice it's got the little BSD symbol on it. Um, so you've got your lab network, which is the network on which you're not putting traffic. One of the most important, th one of the things you really have to do when testing network protocols, especially initially, is to isolate them from all other traffic. Because if you have them mixed with all other, other traffic at first, you will be completely unable to debug them. Because you'll get random, you know, oh look, I got this weird ethernet frame, what is that? You know, suddenly your test stops working. So you've got a lab network, you've got two test lines, usually I'm testing things like uh, routing or forwarding. Uh, the thing I've been working on most recently is IPsec in FreeBSD, and so we care about, you know, the tunnel comes in here, and then the tunnel goes out here, and you have to have this whole setup. You want a serial line because you want a way to control the box without using SSH over one of your test networks. Turns out that SSH generates traffic you wouldn't want to see. Also, when your machine explodes, as it, um, you know, network protocols are in the kernel. So when you make a mistake in the network protocol, your kernel explodes. Um, you want to be able to do serial debugging. So this is your typical test rig, and I happen to have one right here. Um, I won't do the demo, but I have, uh, I tend to, on the road, bring VMware with me and run a couple of VMwares abusing each other on network protocols. So let's go over a little terminology, because um, I'm going to use these terms uh, in the rest of the presentation. We have what's called a device under test. So this is your custom kernel. This is the thing with the new protocols in it. This is the thing you're going to test. Now that may sound simple, but I've given presentations where people are like, what's the DUT? Because I do D-U-T in my, in my slides. Um, you've got the test host. That's the thing that's controlling it. Um, you have your test LAN, and you have your lab network. And I talked about these already. Uh, again, the test LAN really should be, if you're doing conformance testing, quiescent. It should be quiet. There should be no other traffic that, that you don't expect, because it's going to cause problems. Um, but you need the lab network to get things like you know, CVSUP and uh, to pull things down. So what problem was I trying to solve when I built the software I'm going to describe today? Um, well, writing network protocol code is hard. I said that. Testing network protocols is also hard. Most systems that I've seen are incomplete. So they only, you can find a bunch of these libraries on the net. And I'm going to describe yet another one, which theoretically will be more complete. Um, 
But they, what happens is someone goes, oh, I really want to test this. And they get as far as like TCP, you know, and they don't do all of ICMP and they don't do anything else. And then their stuff isn't in there. This is a big problem, not extensible. This is what makes Tahi really hard to use, the system I mentioned earlier, is that describing packets in code, well, you know, you can rewrite the protocol stack and then you've got two implementations in C that you're trying to make talk to each other and that's really hard. Um, so you want extensibility, you want things not written in what I call write once languages. You want to be able to read your code six months from now. Um, and then again, these sy proprietary systems are really expensive. And actually, amusingly enough, incomplete. The commercial vendors who build these things build the tests that they believe will make money. So years ago when we used Anvil at a, at a company, we wanted a TCP test because we were actually going to, we were using the BSD 4.4 stack, which tells you how long ago that was, um, in an embedded product, and we wanted to test that, and they said, well, yeah, sure, if you pay us $400,000 or some huge amount of money, which well, at least to me is a huge amount of money, we'll do a TCP test for you. But we've got this great test for you know, some random cellular phone uh, protocol, because that's what makes money. So these tests are also, these systems are also often incomplete. So what's a poor open sourcer to do? Um, write your own, of course. Make it open source, of course. Can't be that hard, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just code. <clears throat> and I've got lots of free time. Um, so the first way you might do this, and actually I had a summer of code student who decided to go this way, much to my chagrin. Um, you can write packet generation tools in C. Um, using the socket code and using BPF and directly writing these things to the uh, to the uh, interface, you can write all of these tests by hand. <clears throat> and I'll talk about what happens when you try to do this in some slides a little later. Um, so it turns out that you wind up re-implementing the network stack. So our current, this is uh, all FreeBSD quotes, just for IPv4, there are 100,000 lines of code, right? And it really would suck to have to rewrite that. Actually, it re really sucks just to fix it, but you know, it would suck to re rewrite it. So a middle ground is possible. So I wrote this thing called the packet construction set, which is named after, for those of you who are old enough to remember, the pinball construction set, which is a really cool video game when I was a kid. Um, Python library for packet construction, easy creation of packets, gives a more natural syntax for packet manipulation, and of course, BSD licensed. Yes? Yes, I've tried using Scapy. Um, their syntax is interesting. <laughs> so, and I'll, I'll show why, I, Scapy is one of the systems that doesn't, that has more packets but doesn't go far enough in terms of what it gives you for programming, which is what this is all about. So let me get to my next slide. So what we need to get to, <clears throat> uh, that's the TCP header, uh, we need to get from this, which is a description of a packet, to this, oh no, wait a minute, <laughs> actually this. Right, so this is what happens when you want to calculate a checksum on TCP and C. And great, you want to build a router, you want to do something fast, this is how you're going to implement it. But if I just want to send a packet in a conformance test, I want to say the packet's checksum field is equal to the calculation of the checksum. And I want this to be automatic. So one of the nice things about the way this works in Python, which I'll talk about, is that this attribute here represents a set of bytes encoded underneath the object that you never have to manipulate directly. So you set the checksum and it is set and you're done, one line of code. So, what are the advantages of PCS, besides the fact that I'm, you know, giving the talk? Um, it's easy to specify new packet formats. This was the biggest problem, is you look at, say, a C structure, or you look at an RFC, and you can specify the format, but people do really annoying things, like they have 13-bit fields that cross a byte boundary, right? And you've got all these other weird things. You've got, you know, one-bit fields and three-bit fields. And even the people who did IPv6, who claimed they were making things easier by making everything aligned, well, that's mostly true. <laughs> but only mostly, and if it's mostly, then you're screwed anyway. You're just not as screwed, I guess. Um, so what you want is a natural way of setting and getting packet fields. I wanted to do this written in a well-known language. I mean, I could originally have done this, you know, I could have decided to go the full graduate student route, which I am not, and, you know, write, invent a network, la network protocol language and write a lot of papers and pull my hair out. Oh. 
Anyway, um, so I, instead I wrote it in a well-known language, and scripting languages are really easy to play with, modular, well-documented. I actually do write documentation for my code. There's now a 20-page manual for this system, which describes how to extend it. Hello. There we go. So here's something you only want to write once. And this is what the TCP packet description translates to in PCS. So once you've written this, this is inside of an object. Once you've written this and you instantiate TCP objects, you get all of this for free. But I will explain this because it's important to understand what's going on underneath the hood so you understand why the power of PCS works. So what we're doing here is we're specifying, as you can tell, fields. Um, we give them a name and we give them a bit width. And you can see we can actually have one bit fields, right? And the system underneath the hood, actually underneath the objects, does things like bounds checking. So if you write a program and you attempt to put more than six bits into the reserved field, it gives you an error. And it actually gives you an error with like a real error message that says, you've tried to put more than six bits into a six bit field. It tells you, it doesn't say segmentation fault core dumped, right? <laughs> Please go find the debugger and if it works, you'll be able to find out what's going on. Um, so you get all of these and what this gives you, and I'll put this into the next page. Um, no, I won't do it in the next page. So much for my, knowing my own slides. What this gives you is the ability I showed you in the earlier slide to set the checksum, right? You need never twiddle bits. So, and you can compare packets. So this means when you write a conformance test, you have a known good packet, you read a packet from the network, you say, does this object equal this object? If these objects are not equal, print out their difference. That's what you want in a conformance test. You do not want to have to write, you know, wander the bits by hand. Okay. So I'm going to show you a test that someone coded. And it's, this is one of those, those happy, unhappy accidents. So my Summer of Code student was working on some tests like this and insisted on writing this stuff in C. And I said, okay, fine. And then Kip Macy, who's been doing a lot of performance analysis work and a lot of TCP work in FreeBSD, said, I need a library to test this because we've got this problem with the SYN cache. And I gave him the library and he wrote a test. So what is, I'll tell you what the test does first. So the SYN cache timer. The tester, the test controller, sends a SYN pack to the device, SYN packet to the device under test. The device under test is supposed to put the SYN in its SYN cache and then it sends SYN ACK packets back to the tester to continue the handshake process. Now, what we're testing here is the timer, not the actual full setup of TCP. So the SYN cache has this timer which controls how often to send the SYN ACK and the DUT must send four packets back to the tester in under 60 seconds. Now, a slight aside on general network testing issues. One of the things people are particularly poor at, including in some engineers, is understanding what they're trying to do. Um, thankfully, kernel programmers generally aren't bad at this because if you don't know what you're trying to do, your kernel explodes and we don't give you a commit bit. Um, but I work with people who are not network programmers. I work with people who only code in PHP. And the number of times I've had to say, what are you trying to do is really scary. So, What's good about this test, or at least about this slide, is that this is a really good example of what you want to do in a good network test. What makes a good network test is you have an understanding of what you're attempting to do and you have an understanding of the success or failure of the test. The problem with the it works test, or even with the performance tests, is you don't have a very narrow definition of success or failure. Right? If marketing likes the number, then the performance test is passed. Right? But it doesn't measure efficiency or anything else like that. This is a great example of a test that Kip came up with because it's, here's what happens, here's what must happen for the test to pass. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't pass. This is what you really want to see. And this was actually one of the real advantages, one of the only advantages actually, of working with the Anvil system because they were really obsessive compulsive about this. They went through the RFCs that they were testing and every test had a page like this. And this is the equivalent in testing of good comments in your code, right? Of this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, these conditions must be met, pass, fail. And that's it. And then you make a bazillion of these and you run them. So that's what this is supposed to do. This is what this looks like in terms of a network time diagram. Um, we send this in, we get synax, 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 and this should happen in 60 seconds. Very simple. What does this look like in code? Well, the font's a little big, otherwise I could put this all on one slide, but then there'd be no point because you couldn't read it. Um, it's about 60 lines of code. Here we are setting up a, 
a uh, IPv4 object, right? We set its version, its header length, type of service, we give it a random ID. Um, flags offset, time to live, checksum, uh, is initially set to zero because we have to calculate them together, set the protocol correctly, and then we can pass in a source and destination. So here's the interesting part, here's TCP. We have a port, we give it the magic sequence number, for those of you who've read Douglas Adams. Um, we set the sin bit to one. Notice there's no funny masking. We just set that thing to one. We set push to zero. Um, of course, this being a, a nice, you know, high level, slow also scripting language, I'm not gonna win any races with this particular piece of code. Um, everything's initialized to zero when you start. So you don't have to initialize things to zero. We do that for you. Um, so you set the sin bit to one. I don't know why you set this to zero. Check some window. We can set the ethernet. So now you know the ethernet addresses of Kip's machines, because I didn't anonymize them, but oh well. Um, we get the length, and then we calculate the checksum, right? So this is all handled for us underneath. We create a chain of these. We set up a, a connector to the PCAP system, and we transmit the packet. And this is how we test it, right? So while, you know, here's the test coded exactly the way we discussed it in the slide. Um, we set an alarm for 60 seconds while the sync counts less than four. We read a packet. Um, read packet will unpack packets correctly into objects for you. So if you have to interrogate a packet that you've read from the network, you can interrogate it exactly the way I just set it. And you can see the, the interrogation here. D port, the destination port, right? D port and S port, act number, sequence, sync count. It's all taken care of. What's, what's the second line of that? This? Yeah. Oh, packet.data.data. .data. So the way packets are chained together is through their data members. So there's a, there are several, if I don't want to go into, I mean, I can go into it a little bit, but there are several special data members, special members in the object that you can't replace, which are in the documentation. And data is, oh, look, I've got a whiteboard. Um, if I've got an Ethernet packet followed by an IP packet followed by a TCP packet, they are connected through their data members. This points to this, metaphorically, right? This isn't really C. And this points to this. And so if you want to actually get the TCP packet out of a raw packet from the network, you go data.data. Data. Wouldn't that test need a check for this being a TCP packet? Um, actually, no, because it will fail if these aren't there. So if the packets are the wrong kind of packet, it, the other thing is he's filtering for that. Well, he's filtering for IP, but he can filter for TCP. Um, but yes, you could also check for, check for that. You can actually do, because it's a type system, you can say, is it type of TCP? Um, he's not doing that. That, that was the bit I was sort of looking for, guessing it could happen. But. Yes. So some interesting statistics about this versus the version written in C, which I will not put up on the slides. Um, and actually, the thing that, you know, it's, I'm not I'm not ragging the C code. Actually, this guy wrote some good C code. He wrote 600 lines of it, right? 600 lines of C to implement a 60-line Python script, which seems backwards to me. Um, obviously, similar code in the kernel, which handles a lot larger number of cases for TCP, is hundreds of lines. And you don't want to have to do that. You want to basically focus on what you're focusing on the task. So what makes a good test? I talked about this in the, in the first slide. You want a focused test. You want a test that's easy to read. You want it reproducible. You want it to be understandable. And you want it to be able to integrate easily with other tests, right? So small, easy to understand tests are what you want. That way, when you go back and you look at them, you can say, is this really what we're testing? Because if you were to look at that, even if you look at the, the C code that this, this student wrote, you're like, well, yeah, OK, I've paged through it a few times, and now I understand it. Whereas this is, is easy to, I believe, easy to understand. So what packets do we currently support? Um, this is where a lot of, I've had a lot of problems with other systems. So I developed this when I started doing IPsec because the Tahi tests were missing things that I wanted. And because I realized there, that there were very focused tests that I wanted to run that they wouldn't do. Um, so Ethernet and loopback interfaces are, are supported. There is actually a loopback packet format 
It's known as putting the address family into the packet. Um, if you don't do that, your stuff doesn't work. So Ethernet, loopback, ARP, IPv4 and v6, ICMP v4 and v6, neighbor discovery, which is part of v6. Incomplete support for AH and ESP, because I've been fixing the C code. Um, UDP, TCP, DNS, HTTP. And then I've got other people who are using this for protocols that are much higher layer. So there is a group that works on an instant messaging client that's using this for instant messaging. Not to do the client, but to test the client. <coughs> Some future work. Um, well, so here's the problem. More packets. Lots and lots more packets. And if you look at something like Wireshark, which used to be called Ethereal, you know, you've got to, if you really want to be complete, you've got to support a large number of packet formats. Um, so I've actually had a lot of requests for 802.11, not just from Sam Leffler, by the way, um, who that's when he saw this talk, his first comment was, does it do 802.11? No, it doesn't, Sam, sorry. Um, a more complete DNS, maybe Apple Talk, better support of HTTP turns out to be important because people somehow write applications with it. Um, more tests, so uh, I've, Cond? Oh, that's the wrong word. Um, I've sold KIP on using this system to do more of the TCP testing. So there's a whole bunch of TCP changes that went into FreeBSD that need to be tested and need to be uh, checked. So um, KIP's now starting to do a TCP conformance test suite with this stuff. So you can get a hold of him as kmacy at freebsd.org. Um, I want to do a Tahi replacement because the Tahi guys aren't going to keep doing their stuff forever and because I want something that I can understand. And then fuzzers. So last year, I uh, not just last year, but the year before, there was a, a student, a Summer of Code student, who wrote a whole bunch of um, IPv6 protocol fuzzers with this. And actually, that's been one of the few criticisms I've gotten from people at work. Well, not in my team, but other people who've seen this, they say, but you can use this to attack network code. Well, yeah. Yes. Yes, you can. That's exactly the point, actually. Oh, but that's evil. No. No, writing bad code is evil. Allowing it to re and allowing it to remain on the internet is really evil because I'm not the only evil guy, right? You know, if I were the only evil guy, you could get rid of me and it'd be all right. But there's more evil people besides me. Um, so protocol fuzzers, definitely something we want to look at. Um, they're very useful for causing kernel panics and, and other things to show up. Um, a more comprehensive test framework. So one of the problems with all of this stuff is that, and this is the part that a lot of people don't want to write. Um, test frameworks, it turns out, are hard. And test frameworks for networking are particularly hard because the configuration problem is a pain. How do I configure the device under test? How do I make it so it's generic so that, you know, all of, if I could get all of you to do testing with me, <laughs> if I could get all of you to do testing with me, then you'd need to be able to configure your systems on your own. And sort of a text description of that stuff. People have tried it, and it's, it needs to be done, but it's ugly, and it's not something anyone wants to do. <clears throat> but it needs to be there. Because there's no, otherwise, you know, once we have more than 10 tests, you know, once we have hopefully 100 or a few hundred tests, you're going to need something that will run them reproducibly in a regression system. And we don't have that yet. Um, then integrate that into the FreeBSD regression tests. And then more tools based on P PCS. So I have until when? 50? Okay. Um, let me talk about one thing first, and then I may demo the packet debugger. You have a question, yes, sir. Um, have you considered making a tool where you could do a packet capture mm -hmm. and have it generate PCS code? Yes. Based on those packets? Yes. Um, it's very hard. But I was reading a paper about that just recently. Why would that be hard? Well, this I'm is I'm this. Not talking, I'm not talking about generating the code to check that this is what happens. But mm -hmm. you have to take 13 lines to fill out the IP header and 10 lines to fill out the TCP header, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just having as a code generator tool saying this is a packet sequence we're looking for, write a skeleton code that generates these packets for me or checks these packets. Well, oh, so yeah. That you could edit from that and make it into a test case. You, that could be done. I thought you were talking about, so what one, someone pointed me at a good paper recently, like in the last few weeks, where there's a group at Microsoft Research that built a system to infer what a yeah. protocol was with no knowledge. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's hard. Um, I'm, I'm it could be done, but that would be I'm harder. thinking about a tool to, to write this code from captured cases. Yeah, so that wouldn't be so hard um, because you can just basically invert the system. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the thing does do reading correctly, so I can, I can show that later. But yes, I've, in my copious free time. 
Other questions while I'm being photographed? Uh, I just noticed the guy with the camera. Okay. Um, so here's a, yet another project because I need so much more to do in my copious free time. So the other thing, and those of you who read the FreeBSD network mailing list probably saw my mail. Here's something we do not have. This, by the way, is a standard kilogram of uh, platinum. No, you can't have it. It's in, uh, I believe it's at the Arts et Métier in Paris, and this is supposed to be the kilogram that you, when you want to, when you want a kilogram, this is it. Well, as the web that's says. The old one. Is the old one? 50 micrograms off. No, 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 that's not that one. That one's the old one. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> this was once the kilogram. <laughs> now, using Google, this is as close as I could get to the canonical kilogram. So if you ask someone, like a networking person, which I see many people I know from the networking world in here, you say to someone, so what does a TCP setup look like? Well, you know, first we send an ACK and then we get a SYNACK and then, you know, we send a SYN and we get an ACK, SYNACK and then we send an ACK, yada yada. Show me one. Show me the packet trace that actually has the canonical TCP connection setup. Nobody's ever, as far as I can tell, I went looking for this, nobody's done it. People have huge packet traces of, here's all the traffic at, you know, this particular entry point to this country. That's not very interesting to me. Um, what I want to be able to do, and this is what I'm starting to, what I'm going to do next, or as part of this, is to start collecting canonical traces. Now, of course, this is going to be a problem because a canonical trace between FreeBSD and FreeBSD is not the same as FreeBSD and Linux, is not the same as Linux and Windows. But that way you can have these nice short, PCAP captures that can be used in these tests. So that's the next thing I'm, I'm working on with this stuff. Um, and that's going to, I'll talk about that on the next page. Um, I've gotten to my questions slide. Uh, and the last bit here is where that is. So there's a whole bunch of code in, involved in this, well, a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of projects because I want to keep things separate so I can give different bits to different people. In particular, um, my employer has been kind enough to allow me to spend all of my time hacking on this, even though it's only tangentially related to what they do. Um, so I want to make it so that the package they use is separable. Uh, it's all BSD licensed, so you've got PCS itself. I'll talk a bit about the packet debugger since I do have some time. Um, then there's the net test framework, which isn't anywhere near done yet. This has a page, but no data. Uh, and I set up the page yesterday, so it's a very new project. Um, but this is PCAP Lab, and this is where I intend to start collecting these canonical traces, indexing them, having them available to people, so that when someone says, you know, I've got two boxes and they do this, you can compare them and you can test them. Because right now, if someone says, I've got two boxes and they do this, you go, okay, well, you know, put a printf into the kernel and tell me what the printf shows you, right? But you can't really replay a test at them. Um, all of it is readable on uh, Mercurial. I have a, merc a couple of Mercurial um, repos sitting on my my server in the US. Um, there's a version in ports. And this is, this is the thing I need to get people to do more of, which is contribute. I mean, I would, because I'm an idiot, um, spend all day sitting around reading RFCs and setting up packets. But even if I do that, I'm only one person. So I need people to send me mail, send me stuff they're working on, look at the st system, and try to play with it. Um, you can always reach me here. So let me take a couple of questions, and I'll give the quick packet demo. So how do you yes. handle layering? For instance, if people are testing HTTP, mm -hmm. do they have to care about all bit fields in TCP? No. All right. One of the things that um, PCS provides is connectors at all layers of the socket. So you can have a PCAP connector. You can also have a UDP, a TCP, an IP connector, which is the raw sockets, so and, and HTTP all the way up. TCP stack. Yeah. Okay. Right. But if you're doing protocols that are way up in the, what I consider the stratosphere from down here at IP, then yeah, that's definitely there because this is exactly what these IM people are doing, right? They want to test it over TCP and HTTP because their stuff yeah, runs just, over that. If you're, if you're playing with HTTP, you may want to uh, control packet boundaries and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, and I'm supposed to do an SCTP thing for Randall, but I haven't done that yet. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> yes. You were waving at me. I'm not sure I correctly understood it. You said that uh, when you generate a new packet, mm. uh, every field are set to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I know Scapy. I agree that Scapy is not designed for programming, but more for interactive to, to uh, packet generation. Yep. But it, have a, it has a very interesting feature that, that uh, everything uh, has default values which will be computed uh, unless we set a specific one. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, tidbit checksum, we, we get that most of the time we want the good value. So just before sending the packet, the checksum <coughs> will be computed unless you set a manual value on uh, I think it should, it could be, uh, it could generate uh, shorter programs. Yes, so 
Um, there are two things that we do, and I, actually the TCP case doesn't give a good example of that, but other packets have defaults. So an IP object, when you instantiate it, even though um, KIP set it to four, four is the default value. So one of the things you can set in a field is its default value. And so we do that for a lot of stuff. TCP doesn't have a lot of defaults. Um, in terms of calculating the checksums automatically, I've looked at that. There's a little bit of introspection going on in the, in the libraries that I have to pull apart to make it so the thing doesn't do an infinite loop anytime you change any field. Right? So that will happen, <laughs> but it's one of those, oh, when do I stop check calculating the checksum? So, but yes, um, there are default values, that's just not in that example. But we'll generate shorter programs. Other questions? All right, let me do the quick demo because Paul Henning hasn't thrown anything at me yet. Well, let's, let's hope the quick demo works. Can you read that? Maybe not. Mm, maybe not. No, no, you can't change. It must be orange on black always. Sorry. Um, where's the info? There we go. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, black on black. That'd be good. I like that idea. Ah, uh, that's good. Tell me you can't read that. Barely. The color is kind of wonky, isn't it? Okay. Info color. Would you like flora? Would that be? Is that, that more readable? Is that good? Flora's good? Okay, let's do flora. Yeah, it's, it doesn't make the nice chunk 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 sign when I'm typing. So. Um, source. Oh, good, it does work. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Um, I guess I'll send these out over the wireless link. So this is the packet debugger, <clears throat> and this is a tool built with PCS. So the idea behind the packet debugger is you can work with packet capture files the way you work with source code. So in a source debugger, you can say things like list and break and continue, and you can interrogate things in the, in the source code. Well, that's the same idea here. So if I say list, I see, oh, there are these three ARP packets in this Ethernet trace, and it does a a mildly not so exciting job of, of printing these out. These are all um, these are all questions, um, and you can see that the header length is six, the the protocol length is four. Here's the destination address. Here's the source address. Here's the type, right? And just like a debugger, I could say break two, run. Uh, let me bring up one more of these. That doesn't bring up a different one. What if I do this? Oh, that's a little better. Should do. Tick, 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 tick. It's not grabbing. Well, it doesn't like it on the end one. Um, so anyway, what, what, this, what this should have done um, <clears throat> was to transmit these packets on the wireless interface, but I I believe that by running TCP dump, I reset my wireless interface as I just saw it do. For some reason, TCP dump's been doing that lately. Um, anyway, so what this allows you to do is to set breakpoints. You can stop at the breakpoint. Um, you cannot set packets yet. You have help. Um, another feature I added recently is graphing. So the network time diagram I showed earlier, I can actually um, print out a graph from that using uh, dot. So if you've got a TCP session that goes like this, it will trace it and label the edges with the IP addresses. So this is going to be built up into more of a debugger um, for this kind of stuff. Uh, so you know, break, you can delete packets, help list, you can do next, print, run, send, show. You can send a particular packet, continue, you can graph, uh, you can get info on the file. And this is reading raw PCAP files. So this isn't something I, the packets aren't anything that I coded up in PCS, they were captured from an actual session. 
So any PCAP file, you can load it in, you can read it, you can play with it. You can have multiple streams. Um, and then in the next versions, there'll be other things like conditionals. Yes? Can you modify the packet with all? That's 0.2, and I'm at the conference, so it's not done yet. But I will. So um, what will be nice is you'll be able to interactively modify the packet. So you can say tab, and it'll give you all the fields. One of the nice things of the, the CLI I'm using is it has nice tab completion. Which CLI uh, is that? It's the one built. It's basically, what's the GNU one? Readline. Readline is integrated into this library that's in Python. This is all in Python. So, so this is why I can do things like when I hit enter, it does the same thing again. Or I can say tab list um, quit. So that's just all in there, but it's pretty nice. All right, I'm out of time. Um, any quick last questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.